welcome to Gallery Folsom. I'm John Peter Roy. I'm one of the artists in the show. Uh, give you a brief history uh, for those of you who uh, don't know or, or didn't see the press release. Um, it's not. We we're familiar with like sequels, prequels, and reboots in media, television, film, even books uh, and music sometimes. Uh, I'm not gonna say this is the first reboot of a painting show, but it's the first one that I've been to or been a part of. This is actually um, a reinvestigation of the same three artists, or this, a show that investigates the same three artists that were represent my first big show in New York City in Chelsea, in Manhattan, uh, almost 20 years ago, with two other artists, uh, Andy Cross, who's a painter uh, and a bit of a trickster, and uh, Johnston Foster, both of whom send their regards, but they, they couldn't be here today, unfortunately. The three of us had our first big, call it a, uh, you know, an, 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 an arrival party in New York, or like a coming out party in New York, where we had all recently graduated from, from our uh, graduate schools in New York, uh, Andy, and Johnston went to Hunter to get their MFA in the city, and I went to the New York Academy of Art. Um, and there was a gallery run by a guy named Pizza Race uh, called Rare Gallery on 26th. It was a big ground floor space, and this is right when, you know, for those of you who, who follow the art world in New York and its history, it was kind of like an uptown scene early on, think like Jackson Pollock, Leo Castelli, that's all kind of uptown. Uh, then it moved downtown into uh, uh, the East Village in the 70s, and in the 80s it was in Soho, and then it moved a little bit, it split up in the Tribeca and the meatpacking, and then it shifted from the meatpacking to Chelsea, and this is when I arrived. And so early 2000s in Chelsea was kind of like the big, Growth, the centralization and growth of the art world in these large uh, meatpacking and uh, uh, industrial spaces. The first time they were in some really big spaces and big galleries like Gagosian and Zwerner uh, opened up essentially kind of like mini museums at the time. So it was a lot of concentration, a lot of activity, and all the galleries were linked uh, for the first time by like a really centralized kind of geography in large buildings that allowed for big spaces and multiple galleries stacked on top of each other. So it was a very exciting time. It has again since broken up. We now have Chelsea has split into Chinatown and split into Tribeca and a little bit in Brooklyn. So there's a bit of scattering <coughs> happening. But at this moment in 2005, Chelsea was where it was all at. And we had our show that opened called Stranger Than Fiction. We were all showing with the gallery for the first time. Uh, Andy and um, Johnston had known each other from Hunter. And my roommate at the time had also graduated from Hunter a year after them, so I kind of knew them through circles. Uh, and we all kind of hit it off and decided to do this show together. It was a pretty big show. We, uh, we had uh, lots of great reviews and, and a great attendance. And we all showed with Rare for a little while, and then uh, during the recession, Rare uh, shrunk, and we all kind of split off to start new relationships. I showed with another New York gallery, I showed in LA, and then a few years after that, I started showing with Morton. And I've always kind of wanted to find a way to bring those two artists back into the conversation because, not only because I think they're great guys and they're really good artists, but they represent, they're part of this very unique community of artists at the timeline that kind of, you could think of them as some of the original early millennial, early 2000 Brooklyn scene. We, there was not much of an exhibition scene in Brooklyn, but all the artists that were showing in Chelsea had almost all moved to living and working in Brooklyn because of the mechanics of uh, real estate and everything. So they were, they're very, these two guys were very seminal alongside myself in the early days of that Brooklyn scene. So uh, I thought it was a great opportunity when Morton uh, was asking me for ideas to bring the band back together, so to speak. It's been almost 20 years, a lot has changed. Uh, but a lot has stayed the same, particularly in terms of the kind of things, the territory that we were all interested in. Andy is a painter, but also a bit of a trickster, and he's always looking for ways to um, deconstruct a traditional painting tropes and then uh, reinvigorate uh, some traditional tropes alongside them. Uh, Johnston, his work is always three-dimensional, 
uh, but has been kind of focused on uh, the idea of taking found or commonplace or even sub-commonplace materials and elevating them through uh, his sense of humor and his kind of like biting ironic uh, narratives uh, to elevate these commonplace materials, things like uh, found objects like furniture or construction materials or road crew materials uh, and use them as the basis for this kind of uh, illustrative world building. Uh, and these skulls are great because, like my own, they're not just kind of taking everyday materials and elevating them into familiar iconography or narrative historical iconography. He's literally using them as almost a, a, a diorama or a terrarium space to not just be a part of a larger narrative, but he's building an entire world inside these skulls. Uh, my work, of course, is still uh, hyper-focused on narrative and representation. This one in particular, I wanted to, um, I, I think it's easy to say, uh, you know, there's some JP's returning to some earlier iconography or he's uh, uh, bringing back uh, some investigations in the land, into the landscape or into the architectural spaces. I was thinking about it the other day, for those of you who've been to the Guggenheim, the Guggenheim has that spiral set of staircase that goes up the middle and they often use it as a way to kind of map the artist's timeline up this big spiral. And I thought that was a great way of thinking about these paintings in that uh, I'm, I'm thinking about being, you know, 20 years out of graduate school. I've been making, you could probably divide up the work I've made into a number of different um, thematic segments from the post-apocalyptic stuff to the architectural stuff, the self-portraiture, the science fiction stuff, the portal <laughs> series, the, the, uh, the, the use of uh, almost holographic ideas about integrating art historical images as a kind of quotation into the picture. Uh, all of that is in these pictures and it's, it's almost like I'm self-reflexively up at the top of the Guggenheim looking down through my own uh, timeline of iconography and trying to bring it all back up to where I am right now and reintegrate them into kind of like a, um, uh, an, a kind of omniscience of the whole narrative, but that has been put back inside the narrative. So we're not looking at uh, my own history from the outside. We're weirdly kind of looking at my own history from the inside. You know, you can't, that classic trope of you can't, truly understand the system from outside of the system. You have to be inside the system, but of course inside the system, then you become part of the system, so you cannot remove yourself from it. But that's impossible for me as an artist to do anyway. So we have these three positions uh, of uh, kind of like pure picture maker, uh, picture trickster, and uh, impresario material sculptor. Uh, and I thought, that there's no better way to kind of get a feel for uh, where the world is at than through looking at the eyes of three different artists and how they track alongside each other over 20 years. So um, one of the thing about uh, all of the works is that they all reveal themselves slowly over time. Uh, my work obviously is hyper detailed, very obsessive, and now for the first time in a long time, they're very small. Uh, I wanted to try and make pictures that if you looked at them on Instagram, you would have no idea how big they are. They, they feel like big pictures when you're looking at them through social media, but in person, uh, people had no idea that they were actually this small. That kind of sense of invitation and filling a small space with so much information that you don't, uh, you're not able to carry your understanding, you're not able to complete your understanding of the picture within a single viewing. Uh, they're loaded with, with world building. Uh, Johnston's are the same in that they have a material proposition and an iconographic proposition. You know, we all recognize the skulls, we recognize the kind of world building that's coming out of them, but it's not until the second or third glance that we really understand what it is that he made these things out of. Uh, there's uh, drywall screws. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the original plastic material for this is, but if you spend time, and I bet you a year from now, you might see on the internet, a picture of a construction site with some type of tubing that they use to funnel garbage through, and you're gonna go, oh my God, that's what he made the skull out of. Or 
uh, this, the, the bits of um, uh, floral foam that he's got that he's carved into little trees. There's little rewards uh, built into these pictures the longer you look at them, just like with my own. So already we're establishing a common uh, obsessive sensibility between what we want to deliver to the viewer. Andy's work is different, however. Uh, Andy's work has uh, a, a, an initial read uh, narratively and in terms of abstract composition and material uses. Uh, but the joy of at least this particular series with Andy's is that there is not only a double read within the picture, there is literally a double picture within the picture. Uh, if I could get it, Morton maybe, or somebody, one of, one of you uh, big, big, guys. big guys, come over here. Actually, we can see a great example of it on the back of this picture here. We've got a double-sided portrait, or we've got a more uh, uh, traditionally illustrative, representational uh, portrait of the figure. And in the back, we've got this beautiful, impressionistic uh, figurative dance of uh, dynamic form and color going on. Uh, tons of multi-figurative compositions stacked within each other. We've got a dance moment, a moment of a kiss with the large figures up above. We've got almost some animalistic forms happening in there. Uh, it's a literal picture and picture read. This big one back here, if I can get one of you uh, gentlemen to help me uh, flip this around. We're going to lift it off the wall, Soren, thank you. And just rotate it around. Grab your side, just lift it right off. And then if you don't mind coming out into the room, we're going to flip around. We've got this amazing picture on the back. Let me put it back up. You're higher, son. <laughs> uh, push a little bit more on the top, I think. There we go. Yep. Perfect. Um, we've got some of the double-sided portraits mounted here. There's this great one by the door. Don't forget to uh, take a peek at the back side of your way out. We also have these ones hidden kind of high up in all these doors and corners. Um, I'm unfortunately not familiar with all of the, the, uh, the, the sitters in the portraits, but they reveal themselves uh, impressionistically and expressionistically from one side to the other. You already saw the back side of this one. Uh, one of our favorites is back here. I invite you all into the smaller part of the show. The show continues into this space in here. We've got a couple more portraits hidden up in the door right here and on the wall here, but in particular, this great portrait um, uh, of uh, a gentleman whose name uh, I, I'm not recalling right now, but he, uh, I think, speaks for himself in terms of uh, the character uh, that he's presenting alongside the back of the picture, which is a, another beautiful, uh, colorful, expressionistic, more expressionistic uh, moment uh, of the same figure in drag. Uh, and it's this double, this literal double-sided portrait that gives, um, that makes Andy's work so special and that he's a pretty good, as you can see, he's a pretty damn good traditional painter. Uh, and most traditional painters would uh, not allow themselves to paint or to invest or to obsess over a surface that is gonna be hidden from the viewer, right? And I think that's one of the things that makes him so special is that he's willing to allow <laughs> himself to, or willing to allow the picture on first glance to be withheld from uh, the gaze of the viewer and to be kind of found deep in the experience of the picture, if ever at all, and to know that on some level, there is a second portrait that is uh, psychically projecting itself into the space while remaining hidden from the viewer, potentially hidden from the viewer. And that's a real gift to the viewer. It's also uh, a gift to himself in that it allows the picture on some level to be not 100% transactional, right? That everything, every move that I make has to be internalized by the viewer. That's a very transactional mentality, right? Uh, I love the freedom that Andy has given himself to withhold the need for everything to be seen, right? And and that's something I think we could all take a little bit of a lesson from in the hyper-paced, hyper hyper-transactional hyper uh, environment of the early 20th, 21st century. So, um, uh, 
I think uh, they, both of the artists, uh, have really, really rich um, uh, explorations of materials and images that they've made between this show and the last show. So please, if you can, take some time, go on their Instagrams, go on their web pages, and take a look at what's happened uh, and what they've made and what they've been interested in between now and then, because that will give you a way better explanation of where they're at than my meager attempt to do so. Uh, but that, this is the show that we put together. I think it's great, um, and it's a wonderful use of the space. We've done a few, to, if I can speak from Wharton, we, this show allowed us to do a few things with the space that I don't think we've ever been able to do before. Uh, and playing with the space and recontextualizing the space is a big part of why uh, galleries exist, right? So that you don't just end up with the same, uh, you, can, you can play with the building blocks as, as a space and as a, a gallerist uh, with work like this in a way that you don't always get the chance to do. So that's something to pay attention to. Um, that's kind of my, my brief uh, lead in. Uh, are there any questions for me about any of the work or any of the artists or uh, the state of American geopolitics or anything? <laughs> let's leave that on, on, let's not get into that. Yeah.